Thank you, Jeff. It is a privilege for InVarsity Press to again be a sponsor of the Wheaton Theology Conference. Part of our vision as IVP academic is to be evangelically rooted and critically engaged in the issues of the church in the world. And I think that value is very congruent with the values of the Wheaton Theology Conference and maybe why the partnership works so well, both organizationally and spiritually, so thank you. And to thank all of you for coming tonight, we'd like to offer a free copy of the book called Shaking the System by Tim Stafford. If you're looking for some practical understanding and what to do, uh, we'll have copies at the back for, I think, for almost everyone. Uh, although will be as long as they last, but at the IVP uh, book table as you leave the auditorium. So that would be available for everyone here this evening. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, I do want to make a special presentation. In 2005, Jeff Greenman came to Wheaton to be uh, the Associate Dean of Biblical and Theological Studies, and part of his responsibility in that role was to oversee the Wheaton Theology Conference. And during these past eight years, Jeff has provided the theological, much of the theological vision, um, the organizational uh, structure, the uh, relational integrity, and really the spiritual instincts of what is needed, what is valuable, and what is best. And we've really appreciated uh, Jeff's leadership. You may not know, but in a few months, Jeff and his family will be heading north and west, where he'll take on his new role uh, as academic dean of Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. So because this is Jeff's last conference, we, in leadership role, we do hope you'll come back again, Jeff, uh, we thought it would be appropriate just to take a moment to acknowledge uh, his contributions and to do so in two ways. First, I want to mention the fact that the book that was written containing the papers from last year's conference, Bonhoeffer, Christ and Culture, was dedicated to Jeff Greenman. And I think that's an expression of not only the editors but of the faculty here that so much appreciate Jeff's leadership in this area. The other thing I'd like to do is to give Jeff a, a tangible gift. Um, this happens to be a CD-ROM version of all 29 volumes of the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. And we thought it would be a, a trap movable gift that would not take up too much weight, but also be a resource for him in his new role. So Jeff, if you come forward, and we all want to thank you uh, for what you have done for the reading of the It is now my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Stanley Harvoss. He is the Gilbert T. Rowe Professor of Theological Ethics at Duke Divinity School. And there's probably a number of different ways that one could introduce him. With someone with such a distinguished career in his teaching, in his writing, in his speaking, and his pervasive influence in so many circles, uh, we could just spend a lot of minutes articulating all those accomplishments. But what I thought might be most helpful is just to refer to a couple of his books. And by the way, if you're at all interested in his writings, they are on the Baker table and the Urban's table and the IVP table and the uh, table of Wheaton uh, College bookstore. So please avail yourselves of them. But there are a couple I want to uh, call attention to specifically. One of them is a, a small book it was written as part of a, a series called the uh, Resources for Reconciliation from the Duke Divinity School. And it relates specifically to the topic of this conference. If you're looking for something that uh, is practical and helpful, it's called Living Gently in a Violent World, the Prophetic Witness of Weakness. And Stanley wrote this um, in partnership with Jean Vinay of the L'Arche community and is a beautiful contribution and dialogue in terms of this particular topic. So I wanted to make you aware of that, as well as the whole series of books from uh, Reconciliation Resources from Duke Divinity School. And then a second book I wanted to refer to, um, it was on the Urban's table, but it is no longer there. It is um, sold out. But it's a book, a theological memoir, theologian's memoir called Hannah's Child. 
that Stanley wrote in talking about his life. And the very first sentence of that book goes like this. I did not intend to be Stanley Hauervoss. <laughs> and I think that brief statement captures both some of his humor and irony, but also his profound sense of honesty, of really looking at things as they are. And I think he'd be the first to admit that sometimes that has gotten him into trouble. But it's also one of the attractive things to him, that as a prophet, as someone with deep convictions, that he speaks honestly, he speaks with depth, he speaks with clarity, and he speaks uh, to all of us in the body of Christ. And then the third book I want to refer to is a book called Prayers Plainly Spoken. This is a collection of prayers that Stanley prayed at the beginning of his classes at Duke, and his students found them so helpful that they put them together in a book. Unfortunately, it's out of print, but has some wonderful titles, like Save Us From Dullness at the beginning of a class, or Free Us From Self-Fascination. But what I'd like to read is the last prayer of the book, and use this as a prayer of commitment for our time together this evening. It's called, We Know Only As We Are Known. Sustainer of all life, infuse our lives with the joy of your spirit. We know only as we are known. Illumine our lives with knowledge of you, that we may see that our endings are beginnings. Wrench our closings open so that we will not fear suffering. And so learn that it is only through our suffering that you make us your agents. Compel us. Make us free so that we may manifest the joy of friendship with you and with one another. Amen. Amen. The topic of this evening is Church Matters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stanley Hauerbos. I'm honored to be here after such a rich day of, um, of papers, and um, it's, um, um, it's, it's particularly um, significant for me um, um, because I've had people uh, claim me as a teacher, uh, and you saw three of them here today that um, has always uh, made me more than I am. So to see them flourish is a great thing. Uh, so thank you for having me and thank you for having them. I am a Christian. I thought that's not a bad beginning for Wheaton. Uh, <laughs> I understand this is a debatable issue. Um, <laughs> I'm even a Christian theologian. I observe in my memoir, Hannah's Child, that you do not need to be a theologian to be a Christian, but I probably did. <laughs> Being a Christian has not and does not come naturally or easy for me. I take that to be a good thing because I'm not sure, I'm sure that to be a Christian requires training that lasts a lifetime. I'm more than ready to acknowledge that some may find that being a Christian comes more naturally, but that can present its own difficulties. Just as an athlete with natural gifts may fail to develop the fundamental skills necessary to play their sport after the talent fades, so people naturally disposed to faith may fail to develop the skills necessary to sustain them for a lifetime. By training, I mean something very basic, such as acquiring habits of speech necessary for prayer. The acquisition of such habits is crucial for the formation of our bodies. If we are to, be, if we are to acquire the virtues necessary to live life as a Christian. For I take it to be crucial that Christians must live in a manner that their lives are unintelligible if the God we worship in Jesus Christ does not exist. The training entailed in being a Christian can be called, if you're so disposed, culture. That is particularly the case if, as Raymond Williams reminds us in key words, 
culture is a term first used as a process noun to describe the tending or cultivation of a crop or an animal. One of the challenges Christians confront is how the politics we helped create has made it difficult to sustain the material practices constitutive of an ecclesial culture necessary to produce Christians. The character of much of modern theology exemplifies this development. In the attempt to make Christianity intelligible within the epistemological conceits of modernity, theologians have been intent on showing that what we believe as Christians is not that different than those that who are not Christians may believe. Thus, McIntyre's wry observation that the project of modern theology to distinguish the kernel of the Christian faith from the outmoded husk has resulted in offering atheists less and less into which to disbelieve. <laughs> it should not be surprising, as David Yago argues, that many secular people now assume that descriptions of reality that Christians employ are a sort of varnish that can be scraped away to reveal a more basic account of what has always been the case. From a secular point of view, it is assumed that we agree or should agree on fundamental naturalistic and secular descriptions of reality, whatever religious elaborations we may put over them. What I find so interesting is that many Christians accept these naturalistic assumptions about the way things are because they believe by doing so it's possible to transcend our diverse particularities that otherwise might result in unwelcome conflict. From such a perspective, it's only a short step to the key socio-political move crucial to the formation of modern societies, that is, the relegation of religion to the sphere of private inwardness and individual motivation. Societies that have relegated strong convictions to the private, a development I think appropriately identified as secularization, may assume a tolerant or intolerant attitude toward the church. But the crucial characteristic of such societies is that the church is understood to be no more than a voluntary association of like-minded individuals. Even those who identify as religious assume their religious convictions should be submitted to a public order governed by secular rationality. I hope to challenge that assumption by calling into question the conceptual resources that now seem to be givens for how the church is understood. In particular, I hope to convince Christians that the church is a material reality that must resist the domestication of our faith in the interest of societal peace. There's a great deal going against such a project. For example, in his book, Civil Religion, A Dialogue in the History of Political Philosophy, Ron Beener argues that in modernity, the attempt to domesticate strong religious convictions in the interest of state control has assumed two primary and antithetical alternatives, that is, civil religion or liberalism. Civil religion, according to Beener, is the attempt to empower religion not for the good of religion, but for the creation of the citizen. Indeed, the very creation of religion as a concept more fundamental than a determinative tradition is a manifestation that at least in Western societies, Christians, Christianity has become civil. Rousseau, according to Beener, is the decisive figure that gave expression for this transformation because Rousseau saw clearly that the modern state could not risk having a church capable of challenging its political authority. In the process, the political concepts used to legitimate the modern state at least if Carl Schmitt is right, are secularized theological concepts. In contrast to civil religion, the liberal alternative rejects all attempts to use religion to produce citizens in service to the state. Liberalism, in its many versions, according to Beener, seeks to domesticate or neutralize the impact of religious commitment on political life. Liberalism may well result in the production of banal and flattened account of human existence, Beener uh, uh, acknowledges, but such a form of life seems necessary if we're to be at peace with one another. My way of putting this is that 
modernity is the time that produces people who believe they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story. <laughs> um, and if you don't believe that's your story, I can um, um, help you claim it this way. Do you believe you or someone else ought to be held responsible for decisions you made when you did not know what you were doing? No, most of you do not believe you should be held responsible for decisions you made when you did not know what you were doing. The only difficulty with that is, of course, it makes marriage unintelligible. I mean, <laughs> how, how could you possibly know what you were doing when you promised lifelong monogamous fidelity? That's the reason why, that's why we insist that you um, 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 have your vows witnessed in the church where we're going to hold you to vows you made when you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> or, or if you think it... Or if you think it makes um, if you think it makes marriage unintelligible, try having children. You never get the ones you want, and uh, <laughs> and then what do you do with them? Um, of course, um, um, of course, there are answers to that. One is called divorce and remarriage, and of course, divorce and remarriage um, defies Hauerwas's law. Howard Wise's law is you always marry the wrong person, even the second time. <laughs> and, um, um, uh, and of course, um, uh, the problem with children, um, the solution to that is called abortion. The, um, um, it's very serious stuff. In other words, liberalism as a way of life depends on the creation of people who think there's nothing for which it worth dying. Such a way of life was exemplified by President Bush who suggested that the duty of Americans after September the 11th, 2001, was to go shopping. Such a view of the world evoked Nietzsche's bitter condemnation, ironically making Nietzsche an ally of a Christianity determined in the past by martyrdom. An extraordinary claim to be sure, but as Paul Kahn has observed, the Western state exists, quote, under the very real threat of Christian martyrdom a threat to expose the state and its claim to power as nothing at all. The martyr does so, according to Kahn, because when everything is said and done, sacrifice is always stronger than murder. The martyr wields power that defeats the murderer because the martyr can be remembered by a community more enduring than the state. What drove Rome crazy is you could kill us, but you couldn't victimize us. Martyrdom is the defeat of victimization. That is why the liberal state has such a stake in the domestication of, of Christianity by making it a lifestyle choice. In contrast, the modern nation state, Kahn argues, has been an extremely effective sacrificial agent able to mobilize its populations to make sacrifices to sustain its existence as an end in itself. The nation state, therefore, has stepped into the place of religion's belief, offering the individual the possibility of transcending our finitude. War becomes the act of sacrifice by which the state sustains the assumption that though we die, it can and will continue to exist without end, remembering the sacrifices of those who fought and died. That's the reason why war is the great liturgical alternative to Eucharist. Um, um, I recently wrote War and the American Difference in which I argue that the great sacrifice we ask of people going to war is not the sacrifice of life but their sacrifice of their normal unwillingness to kill. And once we have trained them to um, kill we don't want them to tell us about it. It's, um, it's, it's a terrible thing, it seems to me, of what we do. I have earned the description of being a fideistic, sectarian, tribalist because of my attempt to imagine an ecclesial alternative capable of resisting the politics Beener and Kahn describe. For as David Yago observes, most churches in the West, with the possible exception of the Roman Catholics, have acquiesced in this understanding of their social character and have thereby collaborated in the eclipse of their ecclesial reality. As a result, the church seems caught in a ceaseless crisis of legitimation 
in which the church must find a justification for its existence in terms of the projects and aspirations of the larger political order. In his extraordinary book, Atheist Delusions, The Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable Enemies, David Bentley Hart observes that the relegation of Christian beliefs to the private sphere is legitimated by a story of human freedom in which humankind is liberated from the crushing weight of tradition and doctrine. Hart, whose prose begs for extensive uh, quotation, says the story goes like this. Once upon a time, Western humanity was the cosseted and incurious ward of Mother Church. During this, the age of faith, culture stagnated, science languished, wars of religion were routinely waged, witches were burned by inquisitors, and Western humanity labored in brutish subjection to dogma, superstition, and the unholy alliance of church and state. Withering blast of fanaticism and fideism had long since scorched away the last remnants of classical learning. Inquiry was stifled. The literary remains of classical antiquity had long ago been consigned to the fires of faith. And even the great achievements of Greek science were forgotten until Islamic civilization restored them to the West. All was darkness. Then, then in the wake of the wars of religion that had torn Christendom apart came the full flowering of the Enlightenment and with it the reign of reason and progress. The riches of scientific achievement and political liberty and a new and revolutionary sense of human dignity was achieved. The secular nation state arose, reduced religion to an establishment of the state, and thereby rescued Western humanity from the blood-steeped intolerance of religion. Now, at last, Western humanity has left its knowledge and attained its majority in science, politics, and ethics. The story of the travails of Galileo almost invariably occupies an honored place in this narrative as exemplary of the natural relation between of the natural relation of faith and reason as an exquisite epitome of scientific reason's mighty struggle during the early modern period to free itself from the tyranny of religion. This simple and enchanting tale which I assume you all recognize shaped your education in the American high school. The simple and enchanting tale, Cap, uh, Hart observes, Cap, is captivating in its explanatory power. According to Hart, however, there is just one problem with this story. The problem is that every detail of the story, as well as the overarching plot, just happens to be false. Never forget that tale was first of all told by evangelical Christians against Catholics. Never forget that. And then, I mean, he, he, he has it for um, the, the Enlightenment picked it up, but they learned it from um, uh, pietism. Hart's book provides the arguments and evidence to sustain that judgment. What I find so interesting, however, is even if the narratives may be false in every detail, it is nonetheless true that believer and unbeliever alike in our politics assume, though they may disagree about some of the detail, that the main plot line of the story is true. That this story now has canonical status has deep significance for how Christians should understand the relation of faith and politics. Put even more strongly, in the interest of being good citizens, of being civil, Christians have lost the ability to say why what they believe is true. That loss is, I want to suggest, a correlative of the depoliticization of the church as a community capable of challenging the imperial pretensions of the modern state. That the church matters is why I resist even using the language of belief to indicate what allegedly makes Christians Christians. I know that that flies in the face of evangelicals. Of course, Christians believe in God, but far more important for determining the character of Christian existence is that it is constituted by a politics that cannot avoid challenging what is normally identified as the political. For what is normally identified as the political produces dualisms that invite questions such what is the relation between faith and politics? If I am right, that and pre prematurely ends any serious theological reflection for discovery of what it means for Christians to be political. 
As I've already indicated, to make this argument necessarily puts me at odds with the attempt to make Christian convictions compatible with the epistemological and moral presuppositions of liberal social orders. That project presumed a story very much along the lines suggested by Hart. Theologians trimmed the sails of Christian convictions to show that even if the metaphysical commitments that seem intrinsic to Christian practice cannot be intellectually sustained, it remains the case that Christianity can claim some credit for the creation of the culture and politics of modernity. In particular, Christian theologians sought to justify Christian participation in politics of democratic societies. The field of Christian, if I could do away with any word among Christians today, it would be democracy. I mean, it's, just, it's an invitation to quit thinking. The field of Christian ethics, the modest discipline with which I'm identified, has, one, has had as one of its primary agendas to convince Christians that their beliefs had political implications. The determinative representative who exemplified this mode of Christian ethical reflection was, of course, Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr is, of course, the secret theologian for evangelicals. <laughs> Thus his client, I mean, they, uh, they, they don't want to be Reinhold Niebuhr, particularly when it comes to the family, but when it comes to foreign affairs, they just can't wait to kill someone. <laughs> Thus Niebuhr's claim, quote, the real problem of a Christian social ethic is to derive from the gospel a clear view of the realities with which we must deal in our common or social life and also to preserve a sense of responsibility for achieving the highest measure of order, freedom, and justice, despite the hazards of man's collective life. Niebuhr reminded Christians that we do not live in a world in which sin can be eliminated, but we nonetheless must seek to establish the tentative harmonies and provisional equities possible in the historical situation in which we find ourselves. Niebuhr, who prided himself for being a sober realist, challenged what he took to be the unfounded optimism of liberal thinkers such as John Dewey. He would have in like manner called into question the optimism of the story Hart associates with the celebration, if not the legitimation, of modernity. But Niebuhr's support of liberal democratic political arrangements drew on a narrative very much like the one Hart identifies as the story of modernity. The result is ironic, a category Niebuhr loved, because Niebuhr's arguments for the political engagement by Christians presupposed a narrative that legitimates a political arrangement that requires the privatization of Christian convictions. One of the consequences being the loss of any attempt to say what it might mean for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be true. For instance, one of the curiosities associated with what has been popularly called the new atheist is their assumption that the most decisive challenge to the truthfulness of Christian convictions comes from the developments in the sciences, or put more accurately, the method of science. Such a view fails to appreciate that the most decisive challenge to the truthfulness of Christian convictions is political. The politics of modernity has so successfully made Christianity but another lifestyle option, it is a mystery why the new atheists think it's important to show what Christians believe to be false. Such a project hardly seems necessary given that Christians in the name of being good democratic citizens live lives of unacknowledged but desperate unbelief just to the extent that they believe what they believe as a Christian cannot really be a matter of truth. As a result, Christians no longer believe that the church is an alternative politics to the politics of the world, which means they have lost any way to account for why Christians in the past thought they had a faith worth dying for. I mean, in truth, we suffer from, from the Groucho Marx problem. Uh, Groucho Marx did not want to be a member of a country club that would have him as a member. Um, 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 we're not at all sure we should trust a faith we've chosen. 
I need, an, I need an example of what the connection between the truthfulness of Christian speech and politics might look like. I mean, what's crucial for me is how politics is a matter of speech. An example is necessary because I'm not sure we know what Christianity so understood would look like. I think, however, we have the beginnings in the work of Karl Barth. Barth, more than any theologian in modernity, recognized that the recovery of the language of faith entailed a politics at odds with the world as we know it. For Barth, there was no kernel of the Christian faith because it begins and ends with the extraordinary claim that when we say God, we are, that what we say is determined by Mary's willingness to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. That is not, however, where Barth began. Bart began presuming the work of Protestant liberal theologians was a given. It was, however, a political event that called into question Bart's liberalism. On a day in early August 1914, Bart read a proclamation in support of the war policy of Wilhelm II, signed by 93 German intellectuals. To Bart's horror, almost all of the venerated theological teachers that were his were among the names of those who had signed in support of the war. Bart confesses he suddenly realized that he could no longer follow their theology or ethics. At that moment, the theology of the 19th century, the theology of Protestant liberalism, came to an end for Bart. Bart characterized the theology he thought must be left behind, a theology identified by figures such as Schleiermacher and Trelch as the attempt to respond to the modern age by underwriting the assumption that Christianity is but an expression of the alleged innate human capacity for the infinite. From such a perspective, Christianity is understood to be but one particular expression of religion. Such a view of the Christian faith presumed that the primary task of Christian theology is to assure the general acceptance of the Christian faith for the sustaining of the achievements of Western culture. Bart observed theology so conceived was more interested in man's relationship with God than God's dealings with man. For Bart, however, a theology so understood, a theology that is understood as the realization of one form or another of human self-awareness and fulfillment could, find, could have no ground or content other than ourselves. Faith as a Christian commerce with God, Bart said, could first and last be only the Christian commerce with themselves. The figure haunting such an account of Christianity is Feuerbach, who Bart thought had powerfully reconfigured the Christian faith as a statement of profound human needs and desires. Drawing on Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, and Overbeck, as well as his discovery of what he characterized as the strange new world of the Bible. He, he, he thought against the theology of his teachers. Bart proclaimed, God is God. Bart did not think such a claim to be redundant, but rather to be the best expression of who God is. It is a response to the particularity of a God who has initiated an encounter with humankind. Bart says, the stone wall we first ran up against was the theme of the Bible is the deity of God, more exactly God's deity, God's independence and particular character, not only in relation to the natural, but also to the spiritual cosmos, God's absolute unique existence, might, and initiative above all, God's relation to us. So Bart challenged what he characterized as the accommodated theology of Protestant liberalism using the expression such as God is holy other who breaks in upon us perpendicularly from above. There is an infinite qualitative distinction between God and us rendering any presumption that we can know God on our terms to be just that, namely presumption based on sinful pride. Thus Bart's sobering claim that God is God and we are not means that it can never be the case that we have the means to know God unless God first makes God known to us. Bart will later acknowledge that his initial reaction against Protestant liberal theology was exaggerated. 
but any theology committed to clearing the ground for a fresh expression of the Christian faith could not help but sound extreme. Bart acknowledged that his first salvos against Protestant liberalism seem to be saying that God is everything and the human nothing. Such a God, the God that is wholly other, isolated and set over against humans, threatens to become the God of the philosophers, Bart acknowledged, rather than the God who called Abraham. The majesty of the God of the philosophers might have the contradictory results of confirming the hopelessness of all human activity while offering a new justification of the autonomy of man. Bart wanted neither of these results. In retrospect, Bart, however, confesses he was wrong exactly where he was right. But at the time, he did not know how to carry through with sufficient care the discovery of God's deity. For Bart, the decisive breakthrough came with the recognition that who God is and what God is is his deity. He proves and reveals not in a vacuum as a divine being for himself, but precisely and authentically in the fact that he exists, speaks, and acts as the partner of man, though, of course, the absolute superior partner. In short, Bart discovered that it is precisely God's deity which includes and constitutes God's humanity. We are not dealing with an abstract God, that is, a God whose deity exists separated from man, because in Jesus Christ there can be no isolation of man from God or God from man. In Bart's language, God's deity in Jesus Christ consists in the fact that God himself in, is, in him is the subject who speaks and acts with sovereignty. In Jesus Christ, Man's freedom is wholly enclosed in the freedom of God. Without the condensation of God, there would be no exaltation of man. We have no universal deity capable of being reached conceptually. But this concrete deity, real and recognizable in the descent, grounded in that sequence and peculiar to the existence of Jesus Christ. I'm aware that this all too brief account of Bart's decisive theological turn may seem but a report on esoteric methodological issues in Christian theology. But I ask you to remember that Bart's discovery of the otherness of God, an otherness intrinsic to God's humanity, was occasioned by his recognition of the failure of the politics and ethics of modern theology in the face of the First World War. I think it not accidental, moreover, that Bart was among the first to recognize the character of the politics represented by Hitler. Bart was a person of unusual insight, or as Timothy Garns describes him, he was a person of extraordinary vitality and was profoundly a political animal. But Bart's perception of the threat of the Nazis represented, represent, the threat the Nazis represented cannot be separated from his theological turn occasioned by his reaction against his teachers who supported World War I. Tim Garns rightly argues in his book, Karl Barth Against Hegemony, that Barth never assumed his theology might have political implications because his theology was politics. That way of putting the matter, that is, his theology was politics, is crucial. For the very structure of Barth's dogmatics, as Garns suggests, with its integration of theology and ethics, displays in his refusal to separate law from gospel, was Barth's way of refusing any distinction between theory and practice. Barth's Christocentrism meant that his theology was never a predicate of politics, but also true that politics is never simply a predicate of his theology. Garnge's argument that Bart was a political theologian was confirmed in 1934, the same year Bart wrote the Barman Declaration. By Bart's response to a challenge by some Americans and English critics, they were evangelicals as a matter of fact, that his theology was too abstract and unrelated to actual lives. Uh, I love this exchange. Bart begins his defense by observing that he is, after all, a modern man who stands in the midst of his age. 
Like his questioners, he too must live a life, not merely in theory, he says, but in practice, in what he characterizes as the stormy present. Accordingly, he tells his antagonist that exactly because I was called to live in a modern world did I reach the path of which you have heard me speak. In particular, Bart calls attention to his years as a pastor in which he faced the task of preaching the gospel in the face of secularism. During this time, he was confronted with the modern world, but he was also confronted with the modern church. It was a church, a church of great sincerity, he says, a church of great zeal with fervent devotion to deeds of charity, too closely related to the modern world. It was a church that no longer knew God's choice to love the world by what Christians have been given to do in the light of that love, that is, to be witnesses to the treasure that is the gospel. The problem, according to Bart, is that the church of the pious man this church of the good man, this church of the moral man, became the church of man. The result was the fusion of Christianity and nationalism. Consequently, the modern church is a near relative, Bart says, to the godless modern world. That era, Bart suggests, began 200 years before the present uh, the present with pietism's objections to orthodoxy. In the Reformation, the church heard of God and of Christ, but love was not active. The fatal error was that the Christian response, they did not say that God be even more God and Christ be even more the Christ, but instead they said, let us improve matters ourselves. Reverence for the pious person became reverence for the for the moral person, and finally when it was found that that person is so large and of such an importance, it became less important to speak of God, of Christ, of the Holy Spirit. Instead, men began to speak of human reason. Bart then directly addresses his questioners, whom he identifies as friends, to tell them he's well aware of what is happening and that is exactly why he insists that he must speak of God. He must speak of God because he must begin with the confession, I am from Germany. Because he is from Germany, he knows that he stands in a place that has reached the end of a road, a road that he acknowledges may be just beginning for social orders like America and England. Yet Bart claims he is sure that what has, what has been experienced in Germany that is, the remarkable apostasy of the church to nationalism, will also be the fate of those who think Bart's theology to be a retreat from political engagement. Thus, Bart's challenge to his critics, if you make a start with God and, you are opening the door to every demon. Bart early recognized such a demon had been loosed in the person of Hitler. He was able to do so because Hitler's attempt to make Christianity a state religion by creating the German church meant the free preaching of the gospel was prohibited. Theological speech and politics were inseparable. It is therefore no accident that Barth in the Barman Declaration challenged German Christians on Christological grounds. He does so because Barth assumes that Jesus' claim I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father but by me is the defining politics of Christianity. Bart writes, Jesus Christ, as he's attested for us in the Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths as God's revelation. The witness that is Karl Barth, that is how such a life fits into the ongoing story we must tell as Christians of our faithful and unfaithful living out the gospel, means there's no way we can avoid making clear to ourselves and the world that we believe a new world in fact began in the belly of Mary. 
You may well be wondering, if not worried, where has all this gotten us? I should like to be able to say more about where we are now and where we need to go, but I'm sure of who the we or the us may be. I've assumed I should, or perhaps more truthfully, I can only speak from a first person's perspective, but hopefully it is one shaped by Christian identity. Yet just as Bart confessed that he was German, so I must acknowledge I am an American. Indeed, I may be, I am, I'm, it may be I am more American than Christian and thus tempted to confuse the Christian we and the American we. That confusion tempts Christians to assume we represent what any right-thinking person should say because our we is the universal we. If you don't, just think about a day after September the 11th, we must oppose naked aggression wherever it occurs. How did you respond to that we? American presumption is always a problem, but the problem is deeper than my American identity. For I think none of us can assume an agreed upon we or us to be a manifestation of the cultural and political challenges that is the subject of this paper. Given the difficulty of locating the we, some may worry that directing attention to Bart in order to show the political character of Christian convictions is morally and politically an exemplification of a profoundly reactionary position. In Nazi Germany, a Barman declaration may have seemed prophetic, but after Hitler, a Barman-like account of the politics of Christian convictions suggests theocracy. I confess I'm often I often enjoy making liberal friends, particularly American liberal friends, nervous by acknowledging I am, of course, a theocrat. <laughs> Jesus is Lord is not my personal opinion. <laughs> I take it to be a determinative political claim. So I'm ready to rule. The difficulty is the difficulty is that following a crucified Lord entails embodying a politic that cannot resort to coercion and violence. It is a politics of persuasion all the way down. A tiring business that is slow and time consuming. But then we, that is Christians, believe that by redeeming time, Christ has given us all the time we need to be politically for peace. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, bestows upon his disciples the long-suffering patience necessary to resist any politic whose impatience makes coercion and violence the, the only and inevitable response to conflict. For 1,500 years, Christian thought Jesus' lordship meant they should rule the world. That rule assumed diverse forms, some beneficial and some quite destructive. Constantinianism or Christendom are descriptions of the various ways that Christians sought to determine the cultural and political life of the worlds in which we found ourselves. Some Christians look with nostalgia on that past, seeking ways to recapture Christian dominance of the world. That is obviously not my perspective. For as David Hart observes, Christianity's greatest historical triumph was also its most calamitous defeat. The conversion of the Roman Empire, in which it was thought that the faith overthrew the powers of this age, found that the faith itself became subordinate to those very powers. Like Hart, I have no reason to deny the many achievements of Christendom. I think he's right to suggest that the church was a revolution, a slow and persistent revolution, a cosmic sedition, in which the human person was invested with an intrinsic and inviolable dignity by being recognized as God's own. But this revolution, exactly because it was so radical, was absorbed and subdued by societies in which nominal baptism became the expression of a church that was reduced to an instrument of temporal power and the gospel was made captive to the mechanisms of the state. In the stillborn God, religion, politics, and the modern West. Mark Lilla has written in defense of what he calls the great separation of politics and religion, in particular represented by Hobbes. He observes that though Christianity is inescapably political, 
it has proved incapable of integrating that fact into Christian theology. That, that's a very important insight, that though Christianity is inescapably political, it has proved incapable of integrating that fact into Christian theology. The problem, according to Lilla, is that to be a Christian means being in the world, including the political world, but somehow not being of it. Such a way of being, Lilla argues, cannot help but produce a false consciousness. Christi Christendom is the institutionalization of, the con of, the, of this consciousness, just to the extent the church thought reconciliation could be expressed politically, Lilla says. Politics so constituted cannot help but suffer from permanent instability. Lilla, I think, is right that the eschatological character of the Christian faith will challenge the politics of the world in which it finds itself. But that is why, even at times when the church fails to be true to its calling to be a political alternative, God raises up a Karl Barth. For as Barth insisted, this reality, this really is all about God, the particular God of Jesus Christ. The humanity of that God, Christians believe, has made it possible for a people to exist who do in fact, as Nietzsche suggested, exemplify a slave morality. It is a morality Hart describes as a strange, impractical, altogether unworldly tenderness. Isn't that a lovely phrase? Strange, impractical, altogether unworldly tenderness expressed in the ability to see as our sisters and brothers the autistic or Down syndrome or disabled child, a child who is, perpetually, who is a perpetual perplexity for the world, a child who can cause pain and only fleetingly charm or delight, or in the derelict or the broken man or woman who seems to have wasted their life, or the homeless, the diseased, the mentally ill, criminals and reprobates, our sisters and brothers. Such a morality, such a politics, is the matter that is the church. It is the matter that made even a church in Christendom uneasy. From the church's standpoint today, Christendom may be lamentably a world now lost, but it is not clear what will replace or reshape the resulting culture or politics. Hart observes, when Christianity passes from a culture, the, result, the resulting remainder may be worse than if Christianity had never existed. Christians took the gods away, and no one will ever believe in them again. Christians demystified the world, robbing good pagans of their reverence and hard-won wisdom derived from the study of human and non-human nature. So once again, Nietzsche was right that the Christians shaped a world that meant that those who would come after Christianity, having less Christianity behind, could not avoid nihilism. Why this is the case is perhaps best exemplified by how time is understood. Christians drawing as they must on God's calling of Israel to be the promised people cannot help but believe that time has a plot. That is to say, Christians believe in history. A strange phrase to be sure, but one to remind us of how extraordinary it is for Christians to believe we come from a past that will have a fulfillment in the future. Accordingly, we believe that time has a narrative logic, which means time is not just one damn thing after another. <laughs> the story of creation is meant to remind us that all that exists lends witness to the glory of God, giving history a significance otherwise unavailable. Creation, redemption, reconciliation are names for Christians that we believe constitute the basic plot line that makes history more than a tale told by an idiot. Yet that very assumption that history has a direction is the necessary condition that underwrites the story of modernity earlier characterized by Hart. The story that has underwritten the new atheist presumption that if history is finally rid of Christianity, we will discover that through unconstrained reason how our politics can be made more just and humane. 
Thus, Hart speculates that the violence done in the name of humanity, a violence that is now unconstrained, might never have been unleashed if Christianity had not introduced its peculiar variant of apocalyptic yearning into Western culture. Hart rightly observes that such a judgment is purely speculative, given the reality that the past great empires prior to Christianity claim divine warrants for murder. Yet Hart thinks that the secularization of Christian eschatological grammar is the chief cause of the modern state's curious talent for mass murder. An exaggerated claim, perhaps, but it's at least a reminder that it is by no means clear why the killing called war is distinguishable from murder. Given Dan's lecture today, my question is, if a war is not just, what is it? If a war is not just, what is it? Why don't we call it World Slaughter One, World Slaughter Two? As long as you call it war, it still looks okay. I mean, where? I mean, descriptions are everything. This last observation, I hope, draws us back to Karl Barth's theological work. Uh, work. I suggested Barth exemplifies the politics of speech that is at the heart of Christian convictions. At the heart of Christian convictions is the belief in the humanity of God, a humanity made unavoidable by our faith in Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity. Christ's humanity means no, no account of the church is possible that does not require material expression that is rightly understood as a politic. Church matters matter not only for the church, but we believe what is necessary for the church is a possibility for all that is not the church. I suspect humans live always in times of transition. For what is time if not transition? But I believe we are living in a time when Christendom is actually coming to an end. That is an extraordinary transition whose significance for Christian and non-Christian alike has yet to be understood. But in the very least, it means the church is finally free to claim its materiality, its politics. If I may summarize what I take to be one appropriate response to this observation, it's quite simply this. Let's make the most of it. Thank you very much. As we have had throughout the conference, we have opportunity for some questions, the emphasis on the questions, and Stanley will provide the answers. Uh, there are microphones in both aisles so that if you'd like to ask a question, we encourage you to be brief and to line up. And we have about 25 minutes, so for extended time, if, uh, for your anticipation, we will plan to end uh, precisely at 9 o'clock. But uh, let's start over here um, on the left. Uh, pietism's um, unhelpful reaction to orthodoxy. Um, I think pietism was um, rightly an attempt to recover the significance of the body in the light of the dogmatism of Lutheran scholasticism. Uh, and um, uh, it um, uh, uh, and uh, that was um, a great gift that uh, was, was remember, I'm a Methodist. Um, uh, um, um, Zinzendorf had his influence on Wesley. Um, uh, uh, but um, interestingly enough, uh, the way that was done um, uh, uh, produced a rationalism that uh, was um, 
embodied at uh, the University of Holland, um, uh, interestingly enough, that became the seedbed of Protestant liberalism. Uh, and uh, uh, I think none of that's accidental. Um, um, that, I mean, um, I mean, you still see that, as I was saying in the Duke reception earlier today. I mean, you still find um, people um, uh, that will say things uh, that are evangelicals, that will say, um, Jesus is Lord, but that's just my personal opinion. Now, ask yourself, I mean, what produces that grammar? Um, one, uh, it's that personal relationship uh, in a way that um, has lost the mediated, the necessary mediated character of the faith, plus uh, their good democratic tolerant citizens that accept the distinction between the public and the private. And uh, that, and I think a lot of that um, uh, came uh, uh, from legitimate pietistic concerns, but resulted in a rationalism uh, that we're still paying prices for. Yes. Uh, Dr. Hauerwas, would you say that uh, categorically any kind of coercion is uh, unchristians and Christians uh, shouldn't do it, even when it comes to the level of, uh, of, say, a parent coercing his child to not run across the street or do something harmful? Don't or... eat the yellow snow. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Or, say, uh, like the case of church discipline that's in 1 Corinthians 5, where they didn't reason with this incestuous man, but they said, no, you need to leave. Anyone committed to nonviolence that isn't for conflict has clearly not thought it through. Um, um, the, um, um, exactly what you want is um, to have the conflicts you need to expose in order to make um, physical violence less likely. Uh, that's the reason why uh, communities committed to nonviolence are so um, uh, determinatively uh, political and articulate. Uh, I, John Yoder used to drive me crazy. Um, um, I'd say, uh, John, do you want to ride to, um, uh, uh, to the faculty meeting off campus? He'd say, okay. Uh, and um, I'd say, I'll pick you up in front of the library. Which side? Right side. How far down? All the way to the corner. <laughs> you can't stop at the corner. You'll have to do something else, he'd say in this kind of thing. So uh, uh, John was uh, unbelievably demanding about being articulate because he understood, uh, namely, that so oftentimes our failures in human understand, uh, our human relationships are based upon implied understandings that fail to be articulate with one another because we didn't want to face the fact that we really don't love one another. Now, um, uh, and... Um, um, so I'm, um, uh, I think all of that is um, uh, absolutely um, part of the ongoing discovery of a, of a community committed to nonviolence. Look, I mean, you can, I'm obviously a violent son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I'm a Texan. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and so I try, um, uh, I try, um, um, uh, by declaring, and I, I don't like the language of pacifism. It's just so passive. Or, uh, or, or nonviolence. Who wants to have a position that's non-something <laughs> that, that you're not even sure of? I mean, um, so, um, um. Um, I, but I declare that I'm committed to Christian nonviolence because I have no faith in my ability to live it on my own, but by committing, but by, but by um, creating 
expectations in you about how someone should so live that has declared themselves. I have some hope that you will keep me faithful to what I know is true. Now, I take that to be the character of the Christian life. Namely, that, um, that what we are uh, called to do is uh, to be a people that love one another to uh, enact Matthew 18. Uh, and uh, because Matthew 18 is the exemplification of, of a commitment to what feels like a very coercive interaction as a way to avoid the violence that's in our souls. So, you know, I'm, um, um, of course, I mean, of, cor um, of course you're going to um, use um, what um, uh, seems to be coercive with children because I said so. Uh, I think that's a very good reason. Um, um, uh, and children need to learn that it's a very good reason. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but those are under negotiations all the time because um, uh, Peter's um, lecture this morning um, starts putting you down that line because, I mean, do you think we know what violence is? I'm sure that, I'm sure that, um, that we don't. So it's, it's, it's an investigative claim that, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a bad place to start to think killing somebody is violence. Uh, uh, but uh, then there are others. So, I, you know, so I'm always open to being ready to discover what I had not known. Yes. Um, when I heard, uh, what I heard in your speech was um, an ending uh, and of a lot of things, of liberalism, of of Christianity, uh, and I heard you depict what what you see and have read and understand things that aren't working anymore, and um, that we're at a point which maybe we all do feel, which is that there is a great change happening, and I I want to know more about what you what you see in that if that is true I mean it, <laughs> I could be totally wrong too uh, but just more of what, what you see and and, uh, and that last statement that you said of let's make it let's make it count are you a pastor <laughs> no are no. you planning to be uh, no I'm not. Okay. well make sure that you come under the authority of a good one um, um, what I think is partly involved in this is the attempt um, to remind those who are given the privilege to preach the word of God every Sunday to make sure that they know how to use the language that they've been given. Uh, because that is one of the most determinative political alternatives that we provide for people, uh, through which confidence in speaking as a Christian um, um, is, um, is um, a statement about um, what makes my life tick? Um, um, if I mean, I mean, I you know, with my accent, people oftentimes you know, you sure talk funny. Um, uh, well, we Christians talk funny, and um, and all this language about, well, you can't go to the public realm talking about Jesus. Well, I want to know where in the hell that came from. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, I, if, um, I mean, I, it, it obviously comes from Harvard where they train people to run the world. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, at, where Christians, you know, they say, oh, uh, well, um, um, 
Um, we live in a pluralist world, and of course, no one knows what in the hell pluralism names. <laughs> but uh, we live in a pluralist world, and we Christians can't go out there talking about Jesus. And um, you think, well, is it all right for Jews to talk about Torah? Is it all right for Muslims to talk about the Quran? Why is it that Christians can't talk about Jesus? Well, see, Christians think they can't talk about Jesus because they think they're still in control. Once you recognize you've lost, we can talk about Jesus again. <laughs> I, and, you know, I mean, that, uh, so it is a power matter. It is a power. I, once I was giving a lecture at Hendricks College. I don't remember what the lecture was, but... Um, 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 one of the faculty there was a student of John Cobb's, and I just made him mad as hell. And he said, he said um, how it was, um, when, he, when I finished, he said, your problem is you don't give us any theory that will enable us to talk with Buddhists. And I said, well, gee, Jay, I'm so sorry. How many do you have here in Conway? And... Uh, <laughs> What good would a theory do you? Uh, I just think you'd want to go say, what in the hell are you guys doing here in Conway? I, I got stuck here because I had to have a job. That, so, I mean, all I'm trying to do is to, is to uh, I mean, this, this, is, this is an evangelist message. Uh, take yourself seriously and l use the language we have been given that makes our faith true. And then don't be embarrassed about uh, going to the world and uh, saying what it is we believe. Yes. Uh, we've heard uh, a number of times this conference, and you hear in a lot of literature on Christian political witness, the phrase, the common good. Mm -hmm. and that, that Christians have some engagement with the common good. Could you reflect a little bit on whether we should use that phrase, what that phrase means to you, and uh, how we should think about a thing called the common good? Yeah. Well, um, there's a lot to say about that. And uh, when uh, Kavanaugh was using it, of course, uh, the resonances of the papal encyclicals were coming through. And uh, the political theories that were shaping the papal encyclicals uh, presuppose that um, societies have to have a politics necessary for the discovery of the goods they have in common, such as why you need an effective sewerage system. Um, uh, I mean, a good in common can be as basic as a good trench, a good river. Um, uh, and those are to be ordered by the good that we all have in common, God. And so that's the reason why for uh, the encyclical tradition, uh, the worship of God is not uh, irrelevant to uh, politics. So um, I, I am more than uh, ready to use the language of the common good so understood, and that is not the language that um, is given in uh, liberal democratic societies. The language that is given in liberal democratic societies is common interest. And so what you want is to satisfy the greatest good for the greatest number, irrespective of what those goods may be. Now, um, now there is how you get cooperation between people who share nothing in common other than their fear of death uh, is how our world works today. And that's the reason why how the modern state legitimates itself is by promising you're going to get the best medical care available. Uh, and, um, and, the, and by promising that you'll get the best medical care available, the state then says, on the, for, the, for the top 20% and a few others, 
there's a possibility you may be able to get out of life alive. And, um, uh, um, and so those are, so those are the, so common interest uh, won't work. I mean, I, one of them, I oftentimes point out, if you want, if you want, if you want to have a sense of, of what world we live in today, I say, is to understand why it is that medical education is so much morally serious than, uh, than divinity education. I mean, uh, someone can come to divinity school. Usually, they've already failed another line of work. But that's <laughs> and uh, and that's. I mean, God's good with failures. And um, um, you know, and and after a semester, they can say, "I'm just really not into Christology. I'm really into relating." And we say, uh, "Right, wounded healer." Blah blah blah. blah. Uh, go take some more CPE. A kid, a, kid, a kid can come to medical school and they're kids and they can say after a semester, you know, I'm just really not into anatomy. I'm really into relating. And I'd like to take some more courses in um, uh, psychiatry. Uh, and, which shows they don't know dip about psychiatry since it's, bio, since it's chemistry today. Uh, and, um, uh, but, they say, but in medical school they say, well, we don't give a shit what you're interested in, kid. <laughs> take anatomy or ship out. Now that's real moral formation. Now, 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 now why is it that medical schools are, are so much more morally serious than divinity schools? The answer is very simple. No one believes an inadequately trained priest may damage their salvation, but people do believe an inadequately trained doctor can hurt them. Now, just to the extent that people care more about who their doctor is than who their priest is, you get some sense of how most of us live lives of practical atheism. Yes. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I have a question about um, the way you called World War One and Two um, world slaughter, and my question is, um, what should have been our response to that? Like, would it have been just or godly for us to sit back and watch that happen? Yeah. The question is, who is the us in your question? Who is the us? And um, this is where um, what you're hearing from me and what you're hearing from Peter are determined to be different eschatologies. Uh, I, I believe we live at the same time in two ages. And Christians live in the new age made possible by Jesus Christ, which the world has taken God's patience and time not to live in. I want to be as responsive as I can within those, to those that do not share the practices of the new age. But it means that finally there are some things we can't do. Now, what that means is, and I'm, I'm ready, is that Christians are not called to nonviolence because we believe our nonviolence is a way to rid the world of war. But in a world of war, as faithful followers of Christ, we cannot imagine being anything other than nonviolent. Now, that may mean that as Christians, we will have to watch the innocent suffer for our convictions. It doesn't get any more serious than that. But that's also true of just war people. I mean, get, get serious about that because there are certain things you can't do. It would be better for more Japanese and Americans to die on the beaches of Japan than to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki because it's better for more people to die than ever than to have any one murder ever committed. So these are harsh and dreadful loves that has to shape how, as a matter of fact, we, um, uh, our politics is expressed as part of the Christian community. Yes. This will be your last question. Thank you. Um, one of the things I'm intrigued by is um, your claim and demand that we bring um, the truths of religion to the public sphere and that we proclaim Jesus as Lord. And I think part of what's 
what's a struggle for many who hear this is that um, it sounds like we're reverting back to pre-enlightenment period where we have uh, dogma running the show and for many to say Jesus is Lord, that sounds imperialist. It sounds like, um, you know, that there is a, um, that you're bringing something non-neutral to the public sphere. So therefore, how can we have conversation with people um, in the public sphere? That's the seduction of rationalism and of the Enlightenment, is that we can actually have um, conversations because we share this common ground of reason. Once you start bringing in religion to the public sphere, you're bringing in your imperialist uh, religious thing. So how do we meet people who would respond in this way and um, say for you to bring your religion to the public sphere is just imperialism? Well, I'm an imperialist. Um, uh, and uh, and um, but, um, I'm off, I mean, as a sectarian, fideistic, tribalist, I say, you know, I... <laughs> I would withdraw, but hell, we're surrounded. Um, um, there's no place to go. Um, um, uh, so, um, uh, um, um, I, um, um, I, I worry about the presumption that those that represent reason um, uh, have greater capacity to establish agreements prior to people actually talking with one another. Christian, I, I'm a rationalist. I think everything I've said is extraordinary. I mean, just straight reason. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I, um, uh, I, um, and I'm serious about that. And uh, what I worry about is the presumption that you can have a theory that will give you, in principle, the possibility of agreement prior to even finding out what the other has to say. And so, um, for me, the Christian position, of course, first of all, is shaped by humility. I need to know what God is telling me through this person. And um, uh, that means, um, therefore, that uh, our stance as Christians is we want to share the joy of what God has done for us in Christ with others. But that means that witness will always be a challenge to ourselves because, you know, other people respond and say, I believe in Jesus, but I think it's put together this way. And so it is the case that Christian witness in a world in which we find ourselves is always a challenge for those of us who think we know what we've witnessed when we did it. And uh, that's what it means to um, uh, discover that our God is a wily God indeed. Thank you very much.